The following is the first in a series of short presentations that will cover VFD troubleshooting using an oscilloscope. This first presentation will cover scope accessory selection and basic setup. The agenda for this presentation will cover why do we want to use an oscilloscope with a VFD or drive. We will review different types of oscilloscopes on the market, the minimum specification requirements that these scopes should have, the types of accessories such as current clamps and probes, or measurement tools that we will need with an oscilloscope, and high level making sure that we set up these current clamps or voltage probes correctly with the oscilloscope. In this presentation, I'm not promoting any specific brand or model of scope. I'm just wanting to make sure I highlight some high level concepts and specification items that you want to make sure your scope meets if you are going to apply it and take measurements on a VFD with it. So what do we want to use an oscilloscope instead of a basic multimeter or current clamp when trying to troubleshoot issues with a variable frequency drive. Well, the great benefit an oscilloscope has over a basic multimeter or current clamp is that scope can actually graphically show you the voltage or current signal. A multimeter or current clamp is just going to show you a numerical value only. And the basic setup or basic meter or current clamp is only going to show you an average value also. You will not see potential transient events that could be occurring on the voltage or current uh, signal. And the image on the right here, you can see on the top of both of the voltage waveforms for each period, there's a transient spike. A basic multimeter would never see that. It would be average right out. Now, if your meter does have peak setting, you may see that, but you will not know is it occurring every on every period or is it only maybe every other period or every five seconds that event is occurring. Being able to graphically see the voltage and current waveforms can have a big impact in helping you troubleshoot the, the problem that is occurring and why the drive may not be operating correctly and thus help you identify the correct solution to resolve the issue. So what can we measure on a VFD with a, a scope? Well, we can look at the DC bus ripple to start with. We can make sure that the bus ripple is not too excessive by looking at the peak-to-peak -peak voltage ripple. We can take a scope and apply it to the output side of the drive and look at the PWM waveform or the pulse width modulator waveform. We can zoom out and we can see the actual recreated sine wave, or we can zoom in and look at individual transistors turning on and off. If we take the scope and apply it to the front end of the drive, we can look at the individual voltage waveform and current waveform. If we take a scope and apply it at the motor, we can look at the peak voltage at the motor terminals and see if it's too excessive, determine if maybe we need an output drive filter. Or we can also take the scope and apply it uh, between the motor frame and motor shaft to determine if we have any bearing current problems. We'd be looking for a quick a rise in voltage and quick drop when we take a measurement between the motor frame and motor shaft for bearing currents. And then for some higher end scopes, they have the ability to measure input current and voltage harmonics. So what type of uh, scope is best for you? Let's discuss a couple different types in the marketplace. The first one on the left is a portable one with a battery. This is great if you don't have quick and easy access to an AC power source. The downside is the batteries over time tend to degrade and need replacement, or you could be on a job site try, uh, a little bit longer than expected, trying to troubleshoot a problem, and all of a sudden the battery is about to die, and you're scrambling to find an AC power source to plug the scope into. Now, the scope in the middle is a lab table type. This always requires AC power to power it on. Now, the benefit of this scope is there are versions at the high end that are very feature rich. So if you're looking for a scope with lots of capabilities, you may be looking at a lab table style scope. Now, the scope on the right is interesting in that it doesn't have a screen. The first two scopes we discussed, the one on the left, in the middle or have a built-in screen. The scope on the right was a computer-based one where it actually uses your laptop computer's screen to display the oscilloscope image, the waveforms. So it just plugs in between the device you're testing and your laptop. This is obviously a very lightweight uh, portable solution. So how many input channels should your scope have? Well, I recommend your scope have a minimum of quantity three input channels. And the reason I say quantity three is because VFDs on the input side and output side are three phase devices. And we also have to think about lockout, takeout safety procedures and time spent on the job. If I lock out and take out the drive once, make all my connections, either voltage probes or current probes to the drive and then to the scope, I then can turn the VFD back on and then I can individually look at all the individual phases at once or I could, if I wanted to, look at all the phases at one time on the scope. But I'm not having to re-lock out, tag out the VFD to move a voltage or current probe every time I want to look at a different channel. So that's why quantity three input channels is a benefit on your scope. 
There are two different types of inputs your scope may have. The first type we'll discuss is a BNC style, and that's on the upper image there, the circle with the red arrow. This is the type of input I recommend your scope have minimum of quantity three of. The next few slides will discuss voltage and current probes. The connector on all these types of voltage and current probes are all BNC style. Now some scopes have multimeter-like functionality besides being a scope with them. So they'll have banana plugs. These are the same type of connectors that your basic uh, handheld multimeter will have. What's important to note is the these banana plug style inputs, however, will not support graphically showing the voltage or current waveform on the screen. I would now like to discuss two specification items that you want to make sure your scope has minimum ratings for so that you select the correct scope. The first spec item I'd like to discuss is bandwidth. Bandwidth is the maximum frequency that your scope can see. What does that mean? Well, for example, if your bandwidth of your scope had a max rating of 50 hertz and the signal frequency that you're trying to measure is 60 hertz, the scope would never see it. It would just be a flat line on the scope. So it's very important that your scope have a high enough bandwidth so that you can see fast signals that it can occur on a BFD. Now, manufacturers recommend that scopes have a bandwidth rating five times higher than the maximum frequency of a signal you could be trying to measure. Now, the fastest event on a VFD that you will be attempting to measure with the scope is gonna be the IGBT rise time, which is two microseconds, which converts to five megahertz. If you take five megahertz times five, you get to 25 megahertz. So you're gonna say, okay, my scope has to have a minimum bandwidth of 25 megahertz. Well, the good news in the marketplace today, almost all scopes have a bandwidth well in excess of 25 megahertz many of them into the hundreds of megahertz. So you shouldn't have too hard a time finding a scope that meets the bandwidth requirement. Sample rate's the next specification item I'd like to discuss with you. Sample rate on a scope is defined as how many samples are taken per second. When a scope is measuring or seeing a signal come in, it's trying to take samples of the magnitude of that signal as fast as possible. The more samples it takes per second, the better it can recreate the signal on the screen of the scope. Now, as I mentioned before in the previous slide, the IGBT rise time is the fastest signal that most likely you'll ever measure on a VFD. So that you can accurately recreate this a signal on a scope screen, I'd recommend that your scope have a minimum of one giga samples per second rating. If it has more, that's better. Once a scope has been selected, it's time to think about accessories to go with the scope. We'll first talk about voltage probes. Since a VFD's DC bus and output waveform are not referenced to earth ground, we'll want to select a differential style voltage probe. Now, one of the first spec items you may notice when looking at different voltage probes are, is it a 10 to one or 100 to one? All that means is how much is the incoming voltage divided by before it's inputted into the scope. If it's 480 volts divided by 10, it's 48 volts. If it's 480 volts divided by 100, it's 4.8 volts that's inputted into the scope. Now, obviously, the greater the attenuation, you would say, well, that's safer to work with. Now, one of the downsides of that is that the amplifier circuit in a scope is going to have to amplify that signal more to put it make the image on the screen. So what can happen is, with, a, for example, with 100 to 1 attenuation of voltage probe is the amplifier circuit may amplify the signal and it, what it could be doing is inducing noise or not real events into the signal that is produced on the scope screen. And unfortunately, you may not realize, it, is that noise I'm looking at or is that the real signal? So sometimes going with a 10 to one is better than a 100 to one. Now, one of the benefits of a higher attenuation voltage probe is that it has lower capacitance in the probe and this can improve response time. So if you're look, trying to follow very fast signals, you'd want higher attenuation style probe that has very low capacitance in it. There are two major types of probes also in the marketplace. There are active probes and passive probes. In the right image, there you see on the left there, active probe. And on the right image on the far right there, that uh, gray voltage probe is a passive probe. In our ABB VFD HVAC application lab, we just use a passive probe that's 10 to one. That's what we use most commonly. That provides the safety we need, and for the type of signals that we're looking at, even for the fast rise time of an IGBT, the response time of a passive probe is fast enough for us. Now, one of the big differences you also notice when looking at two styles of voltage probes are active probes are much more expensive compared to passive probes. Whatever type of voltage probe you do select and want to use, make sure it's rated for up to 1,000 volts AC or DC, as you could be measuring signals, for example, on the DC bus that are 850 volts or even up even higher. So you want to make sure the voltage probe is safe to work with at these high voltages. The next accessory you'll need to analyze a VFD is a current clamp. Some current clamps create only AC current, 
while others can read AC or DC current. Some current clamps require a battery to function, while others do not. If you do have a battery with your current clamp, make sure when done using it to shut it off. Otherwise, when you come back and want to use it again in the future, the battery most likely will be dead. and You'll have to go scramble to find a new battery. Now, the big item you'll notice when selecting current clamps is the max current rating that the clamp can read. You want to make sure you think about the type of signal that you're measuring and the max current rating on the clamp. If I'm, for example, reading a 10 amp, 10 amps, I don't want to use a 1000 amp current probe as the resolution on the scope is very poor. I will not be able to amplify the signal very much. For example, if I'm reading 10 amps, I only want to maybe have a current clamp that's rated for 40 amps or maybe even 100 amps max. Now, some current clamps have adjustable settings on them, a little switch possibly. If it does have that switch, for example, make sure to set the switch in the correct setting, the max current setting that's proportional to the current that you're attempting to read. Now, once you've selected your accessories, your voltage probes and current clamps for your scope, it's very important that when you use them on the scope that you set up the input channels correctly. If you don't set up the input channel for the voltage probe or current clamp, your signal you may be reading may not be relevant or will not be useful data. In the example on the right here, I'm setting up a voltage probe. So I select voltage and then I have to set up the attenuation ratio. This is very important, otherwise the scaling on the screen will be off. And the data, when you look back on it later, won't make any sense. Now, if you get a high-end scope with high-end types of accessories and probes, some of this setup can be automatic when you just plug in the accessory into the scope itself. Something to think about when using a current clamp is that a current clamp is actually not taking a current signal and just putting it right into the scope. It's actually taking a current signal and converting it to a voltage signal. And that then means you have a voltage per amp ratio. So when you set up in a scope the input channel for a current probe, you'll select current, and then you'll be selecting, most likely it'll be a micro or millivolt, maybe even a full volt per amp ratio. You wanna make sure again you do this correctly, otherwise the signal on the screen will not look correct and measurements taken from it will be meaningless. All right, let's summarize what we discussed today. First, I recommend your scope have a minimum of quantity three inputs. This allows you to hook up, for example, three voltage probes all at one time during a lockout takeout procedure. And then you can see all the individual waveforms in each phase without having to re-lockout takeout your VFD to move uh, voltage probes, for example. Next, the minimum specifications I recommend your scope have are 25 megahertz bandwidth and one giga samples per second sample rate. This will allow you to see the fastest signal normally you'll be trying to check at, which is the rise time on an IGBT. Like I mentioned before, in our HVAC lab at ABB, we just use basic 10 to 1 passive probes. This will work for basic VFD measurements that you'll be taking, but you can always spend more money and get, for example, a high-end active probe. You want to make sure uh, when you select our current clamps, that you select current clamps that are proportionally sized to the signals that you're measuring. For example, you don't want to use 100 amp current clamp when trying to measure a 10 amp signal. So some current clamps, as I mentioned earlier, do have adjustable settings. So maybe get a current clamp that has adjustable settings. So then you are covered for multiple different current ranges. And once you've uh, selected your current clamp and voltage probe when connecting them to the scope, make sure that you set up the scope correctly. So the magnitudes of the signals on the input channels are displayed correctly on the scope. This is Peter Wilder with ABB. And this concludes the scope and accessory selection and basic setup presentation.